this is Bethany with the Birth and Body Podcast. I'm a midwife in the DFW area doing home and birth center birth. And today I have a really special guest, Dr. Carol Phillips. She's been a chiropractor for 30 years and also does dynamic body balancing, which you have come up with that name and kind of what I want to interview you about today. So welcome to the show. So tell us a little bit about, I know you first started as a chiropractor. How did you end up adding other cranial sacral to your sort of practice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was in school when uh, Upledger came up with his uh, technique, cranial sacral. Cranial had been around since the early 1900s, mostly osteopathic. But Upledger put it into a recipe that he could teach. And um, that's how I learned. And then when I got out of school, I started doing cranial work on all my patients. And uh, a couple years later, I was teaching at Northwestern University, chiropractic, Northwestern Health Science University, not to be confused with the medical Northwestern University. Sure, but, sure. Uh, yeah, I started uh, teaching there and um, started doing pediatric classes in for our profession and became the cranial sacral specialist for our profession, teaching okay. that to chiropractors. It's an adjunct to chiropractic. It's not typically done by chiropractors. Right, um, right. But those who are dedicated to looking at the whole body and taking the time um, learn cranial work to add to what they're already doing. How would you describe why that might be helpful? I know a lot of people see chiropractors that don't also do more of the soft tissue fascial work that cranial sacral is. So how do you, why do you do both for people that might not know? Well, because uh, while adjusting the spine is extremely helpful, and that's why we've been around over a hundred years, uh, you have to ask yourself what's pulling that bone out of place in the first place right. because a bone out of alignment, something's pulling it out. Bones don't move on their own. And I found because I've always done maternal and pediatric, um, a maternal pediatric practice, I found that you've got to look beyond just making the adjustment if there's soft right. tissue uh, misalignment. And so have, doing a pediatric practice, they didn't fall out of a tree. They didn't fall off a bike. You know, right. the only thing they've been is in utero and birth. So having people bring me their babies who were not uh, sleeping, crying all the time, yeah. severe colic, reflux, you have to look beyond adjusting the spine because that's mm -hmm. not the problem. It hasn't okay. accommodated to that point yet. Sure. So um, adding soft tissue work and adding cranial work makes sense. Babies come out with their head first. Right. or their butt first, right. and that's the cranial sacral connection. And uh, that's where the injury is going to be. And you don't need to be, you know, forceful at all because it's all dura. It's all soft membrane. So. Okay. Well, do you mind if I ask you about how you discovered it for yourself or how it was helpful for you? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's It was instinctive to take the classes. It felt okay. right to me. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was in a small workshop setting like you're taking with yeah. me. And I was with an osteopath who was teaching cranial work. And she asked me to lay on the table so she could demonstrate. Yeah. And when she did, she put her hands on the top of my head. And out of the blue, my legs started moving. Mm -hmm. It was shocking. It was scary. I had no control over my legs. And they started twisting and turning. And... Uh, she just let my body go in, in the way that it had to go while she was holding my head. Everybody left and went and practiced their own stuff while I was humiliated, mm -hmm. embarrassed that my legs were moving and I couldn't control them. But what I could see in my mind, I was a foot lean breach um, in my I own see. personal delivery. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. You could see, yeah. I um, they didn't know I was a foot lean breach. And after 26 hours of induction, they oh, wow. put my mom to sleep and went in with forceps only to find my legs mm. and pulled me out by forceps with my legs and then my head. So I recreated that sure. at, with her just touching the top of my head. And when my body twisted and turned and then finally stopped... She brought the class back together, and I, we all sat down in our little half circle. And she said to the class, uh, just ignore Carol. She's probably going to keep unwinding. Sure. And um, 
I was sitting there when all of a sudden my head started to turn and it, my chin went toward the ceiling and I couldn't stop it. I had no control over it and I could feel the muscles in my neck ripping and uh, and then my head started to come down and then it went back the other way and I was mortified and embarrassed and this guy next to me just started laughing really hard. He goes, I'm sorry, that is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Wow. And as soon as my head came back down, I bolted. I ran out of the room wow. outside in the parking lot and I walked and walked and walked and I wouldn't go back in the room. Wow. And I vowed that nobody's ever going to touch my head again, ever. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and and that was I could feel them using my body to twist my shoulders, to twist my head, to try to get my my head out. Right, with your breath. And, yeah. yeah. So I went on um, learning it, teaching it, and years later, I'm at Northwestern, and I have externs who I'm training and um, having them assist me as I worked on people. And about six years later. I went to an official Upledger class, and now there's like 40 people in the class, and my students were there. And uh, at the end, he said, okay, I need an assistant. And I said, you know, I'll help you. I always had my students helping me. And he said, okay, get on the table. I went, "Mm, no, no, not getting on the table. Get on the table. I'm like, no, I'll help you, but I'm not getting on the table. Get on the table. So I get on the table, and he touched my knee. And as soon as he touched my knee, my hands came up and they said they turned purple and they were clawed, like, you know, mm-hmm. this. And I just quit breathing. Wow. I felt I had no need to breathe. It was like I was in utero again with an umbilical cord. Inside my head, I was fine, but I was convulsing. And so they were putting sweaters on me and he's going, Carol, are you okay? Are you okay? And inside, I'm saying I'm fine. I'm fine. But uh, outside, I wasn't breathing to their knowledge. And I was doing this in purple. And then he sent everybody away to practice so that um, I could just go through the process. And he's not touching me. He just had his hand on my leg. And uh, I had to deliver one arm and then I Mm. delivered the other arm and then I felt the cervix close around my neck yeah and one by one I felt the bones flare as I now know they would do if you pull a baby who's breech and put them in extension then they have to open the cervix with their jaw which makes things flare in the opposite direction of what they should be doing right and it was uncomfortable my I could feel the enamel on my teeth as I was doing this I didn't have teeth back then and uh, finally I delivered my head and I was again just mortified and luckily I was so thankful that he sent everybody away but the peace I felt inside was like I'm fine I'm fine until I had to deliver my head Uh, so after that I thought why did I have to go through that Why? Because when I, uh, before chiropractic, I lived with migraines from the time I was born until almost 30 years old. And uh, with chiropractic, the migraines went away. But I had to be adjusted every week. My atlas would go out if I got stressed, if I sat on the wrong side of the room. So... And what, say, can you say more about that for people who don't know, like if you're that sitting was, on the wrong side of the room? Uh, well, we found trouble? out later through x-ray that if I sat on the left side of the room and turned toward the instructor, my atlas would go really high on the left and put pressure on my brain step. Mm-hmm. But if I looked to the right, uh, to the left, sitting on the right side of the room, yeah. my atlas would shift into position. Mm-hmm. And so um, I would just get adjusted. Sure. And I could keep my migraines away uh, by getting adjusted where I had had these issues, physical issues for 30 years. And um, about a year after that session, that cranial session where I rebirthed my body, I thought, when was the last time I was adjusted? I mean, I had my atlas had not gone out of position oh. in almost a year. And that's when I realized I had to correct the soft tissue injury that was pulling that atlas out of position so under any kind of stress i would tense and pull the atlas back out so i didn't need to be adjusted every single week i needed to recreate the injury right and um and that's what i think i allow babies to unwind right from Mm -hmm. the get-go once they start to move i'm fine letting them go wherever they need to go because i felt it within my own body and i think that's 
why I, I had to be drawn to cranial work to, to see that. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. really powerful. Yes. Thank and, you for sharing uh, your story. Uh, I was teaching cranial work for, you know, on weekends. I would yeah. work during the week, teach on the weekends. And one time I was in uh, Florida. My mother came because she lived in Florida. So she came and listened to me lecture about cranial work for 12 hours. At the end of yeah. the class, she came to me and she said, do you suppose that bus accident I was in when I was pregnant made you go breach? Oh. And I'm like, what bus accident? And she said, Christmas Day, when she was six months pregnant with me, with my little brother, who was a couple months uh, sure. old at the time, they were in a bus in Ohio on an icy road. And she had laid him down on the seat in the back seat of the bus of this traveling bus. It wasn't their bus. It was sure, a sure. Greyhound bus. Sure, kind of sure. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, she said she sat down in her seat and suddenly the bus went into a spin, and she felt centrifugal force just flatten her to the seat. Well, imagine I'm a baby tethered by right. an umbilical cord, how I must have spun mm -hmm. inside there. And then the bus flipped over, end over end, and um, she and all the other passengers had to fight their way out the, the exit door. Mm. She didn't know where my baby brother was. She didn't mm. know that my dad had picked him up and was holding him at the time that the bus went into the spin. So then she jumped out of the bus and it burnt to the ground. Oh my goodness. Now, I never knew any of this story. Wow. And um, they went to a doctor and he said, you're fine. The baby's fine. And that was it. That was the end of that story. And I never got told that story. I was just always told, well, you were born backwards. You've always been backwards. you know, Because yeah. I had a lot of learning disabilities okay. prior okay. to chiropractic. Sure. And so that's where... We start to take a look at, oh, when did that happen to me? Why did I go breach? That's mm -hmm. not the way we're designed to come out. Right. So <clears throat> there's the pregnancy aspect of it. Yeah. Um, it happened in utero. That's so and I had to recreate that to yeah. correct it. So it's <clears throat> sort of, I know for people that are familiar with spinning babies, they understand that the baby really uses the space it has to assume the best position. So okay. often with breech babies they're just doing the best they can and exactly the soft tissue around them that they they're yeah doing their best doing with the, what they have so for people that might not understand that could you explain more maybe why that accident for your mom affecting her soft tissue might lead you to be breech exactly and people have to understand that it was for my mom it was a choice that i made a choice to come out foot first, right. you know, and it was extremely painful for her. And she didn't even want to talk about it because it was so painful for yeah. her. But when, when the, uh, people don't realize the uterus is not just floating around and we're okay. He's big enough. He has enough surfactant. We can induce and get him out because it's just floating right. around. In there. That's not the case. The uterus is anchored firmly to the pelvis with ligaments in the front to the pubic area and a big ligament to the sacrum and the ilium in the back that's wrapped all the way around the uterus. So it anchors that uterus in there. And then uh, moms have three layers of pelvic floor muscles that guide the baby down because there comes a point in the middle of her pelvis that the ischial spines come together and baby can't fit through there. They right. have to turn 45 degrees to get past that area. Mm -hmm. So they start out with their face this way coming into the pelvis and they end up with their face this way right. to get out. And the mother's pelvic floor muscles guide the baby in doing that. And then the uterus opens up really big. So the baby can float around in there and grow in there and stretch and move and do all their primitive reflexes right. within the uterus. Unless her pelvis is torted, torqued, and it would only be if the pelvic floor muscles are sure. twisted and then it twists the ligaments which twist the uterus which may close it down at the bottom mm -hmm. and make it bigger at the top sure now about seven months in utero the amniotic fluid mysteriously decreases they don't know how that happens but it decreases mm -hmm. and now the baby has lost their buoyancy now they're affected by gravity and at this point the heaviest part of their head is their brain and their skull so gravity takes effect and they start rolling their head downward with gravity and it fits down into the pelvis 
and into the uh, bottom of the uterus right. unless it's twisted. Right. And then gravity can't take effect and they'll go sideways because it's wider here. And if it continues to get more and more twisted as the abdominal muscles go forward, you know, then it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And then they have to go this way. And then pretty soon they're, they may be straight up and down. It may be that they can't even cross their legs because it's so tight, which was in the case of my mom, who's all of five foot tall, little tiny sure, person. Sure. <clears throat> so the That's best way point. for me to fit was to straighten my legs. Right. And when you straighten your legs, you also straighten your arms. That's the way we, we work, you know. And so sure. instead of having my hands here because mm-hmm. they didn't fit, my hands were also yeah. down or restricted. Sure. And so... Now, I, moms may not even know. She had no idea I was breech. The doctor didn't know I was breech. Wow. Of course, this was 70 years ago, but he sure. just didn't know. Sure, sure. And, but I got in the best position I could get to fit in that very tight, yeah. twisted pelvis. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, they thought, well, she's, you're overdue. We're going to induce. And <clears throat> 26 hours later, she's going got a frog in my throat. <clears throat> She's saying, I can't do this. I can't do it anymore. So they just put her to sleep. Wow. Said, okay, fine. We'll take her out. And all she remembers is waking up in the recovery room and the doctor saying, you would have never gotten that kid out. Wow. You know, she was so straight, uh, foot lean. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's just, the babies are doing the best they can do. And now their primitive reflexes help them maneuver as well. They have a job to do. So if the mom is in a state of balance, her legs are balanced, then her pelvis will be balanced and her pelvic floor will be balanced. The uterus will open. And now they have reflexes that help them maneuver through their, like one man in one of my classes once said, do you know how they put a rocket into outer space? And I said, no, no. He said, it's exactly what you just described. They torque. Yeah. They twist, they torque, and that's what gets it up through the atmosphere. Interesting. And that's what a mm-hmm. baby does coming out. They have to twist and turn to fit the pelvic sure. and then spiral them their way out. Yeah. And so when I work on babies who didn't get to come out that way, um, right? I watch them recreate sure. their birth position, and you go to the mom, here's why you couldn't get him out. You can visualize, vocalize, hypnotize. You can do all of that, but if that leg is in the back and one arm is in their back, their head cannot be straight. They cannot do their reflexes. They're not going to fit through your pelvis, right. no matter what you do. Right. Um, so our job is to balance the mother so that the baby can do their job right, and get their way, spiral yeah. their way out. Yeah, that's so true. I can't tell you how many moms have told me or they feel like it's their fault as to why labor didn't work or why was it so long or I did all the things, I did hypno babies or whatever, Mm -hmm. and it just was still long and they feel like I didn't relax enough or something wasn't Mm -hmm. right and it's their fault and how often it is soft tissue. It's not that their baby was too big or anything like that. It's just the slightest Mm -hmm. amount of twist can make the space that much smaller resulting in more interventions or whatever why i my theory for years and years and years i've been teaching why why is it birth is getting harder and harder and harder and harder we're seeing more and more and more that just can't get their babies out why is that you know well we'd like to say well it's medical intervention you're inducing too soon or this or that i believe and i have since the early 1990s when i started teaching it's seat belts it's a uh, seatbelt injury. How many women do you know that haven't had at least a fender bender in their car? You know, I've already belt? had three clients just this year pregnant in car accidents. Right. I feel like it goes up and up. It oh, almost right. seems like yes. every um, other month someone's calling me, this just happened. I just had a car accident. Mm-hmm. So and the, the accident doesn't have to be during pregnancy. Right. It can be, you know, any right. time prior to pregnancy. So I've always tried to explain, we have a three-point harness. So we have a, a lap belt that holds our pelvis tight against our seat, mm-hmm. and it's not going to rotate. Then we have a harness that comes across the shoulder and hooks in here. This shoulder, if you're a driver, doesn't have anything on it. So on impact, even a, a slow, you know, rear ender, this free shoulder goes whipping around that harness. Now this is held stable. So that puts the twist in the muscles all the way down. And, um, you know, people think, well, I, I was just bumped, you know, from the back. 
And I was teaching this in one workshop when a woman came to me afterwards crying and she said, keep telling people that because last month I was eight and a half months pregnant and I got bumped at a stoplight and my baby died an hour later of Mm. a ruptured umbilical cord. Mm. And people don't realize how much force the weight of a car, if you look at physics, the weight of a car may be 2,000 pounds and when they stop suddenly against another car, that energy keeps going. Mm -hmm. And if it's slow, it really stays within the car. If it's fast, it may right through. But it that baby has nowhere to go. The mother is stopped by her seatbelt. She may go forward and then it slams her back yep. with that twist. But the baby in water goes forward. Now, if he has a short cord, it's enough to to break. Very, very rare. Sure, very, sure, rare, rare sure. That it happens, but it happened to her. Yeah. And um, uh, research done um, by chiropractic students oh, way back in the early, early 1990s, they were looking at a lumbar injury with a whiplash injury. Um, but I connected that with uh, pregnant women and, and how, yes, it torques. And, and they showed that people who are, say, a driver, the harness is over here, and they were hit broadside from the right. There's so much force that this whips around like that. A hundred percent of those people develop low back pain. Sure. And yet if they were hit broadside over here, very few developed low back pain because the harness held them stable Ah. and it depends on where you were hit yeah so i spent over a thousand women i i surveyed that were my patients were you ever in a car accident um prior to pregnancy and did they have what was each of their births i documented each of their births sure and almost across the board women who had long prolonged labors had histories of car accidents wow and those who were hit broadside from the opposite side of where they were sitting had the worst. Okay. No, one time I had <clears throat> one woman who had four babies, seven car accidents prior, and never had a problem with birth. Oh. They all flew out, and I thought, well, there you go. It's, you know, it's not everybody. Sure, sure, sure. <clears throat> but then in asking her where, you know, each accident, what happened, the first one, she spun her car. And the second one, she went down into it. Well, no, she spun her car and went down into a ditch, and the engine came up into the front. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, ooh, I'm writing that down. That's really bad. And the, the second one, she flew through the windshield. And I said, no, wait a minute. You had a seatbelt on, right? Assuming she had a seatbelt on. And uh, I hadn't asked where was the seatbelt on the first case because that was such a dramatic injury and she said no i've never worn a seatbelt ever she said they said i would have died in that first accident if i'd had a seatbelt on wow but uh, she said so i've never worn a seatbelt so here it is you know seven car accidents four easy births sure. but never wore a seatbelt even though she had these seven accidents and uh, so that that was the beginning for me looking at uh, what injuries women had. And it wasn't just the seatbelts. The top three things were horseback. Mm. If they were a Western yeah. saddle versus an Eastern saddle, the Western saddle, if they went off the horse, their foot would you know, get caught in the stirrup and they always landed on their shoulder and neck. But there's always that twist because of the position of the Western saddle. Mm. Eastern saddle, they'd be up, they'd go over the front. They could break their neck, but no right. twist. They just right. go up and over. Okay. Uh, so falling down the stairs, horseback, and seatbelt car injuries. And it's it's gotten worse and worse and worse when we mandated seatbelts. Um, but how can, you know, you really get through life without a fender sure. bender, sure. you know, yeah. and a car accident? So I've always, always asked their history of car accidents. Where were they sitting in the car? And then what was the birth like? Sure. So I know they're, if they've had a seatbelt injury, it may be a long, prolonged, slow labor. The baby's going to need more time. Sure. But I definitely know, if I know in advance, they're going to need dynamic body balancing sure. to release the soft tissue before they try to bring a baby out. Sure. They'll get them out, but it will take yeah. a while to sure. get them out. And often no, more painful. Yeah, more painful, slow, and of course more intervention yeah. because we're on a time clock mm-hmm. when most people do a hospital birth. Now, if they do home birth, sure, we you know two days, three days, on, off, start, yes. stop, drive everybody crazy. Yes, but give the baby time to sure 
maneuver their way through. Okay. But the ideal thing is what you're doing. Right. In, you know, do soft tissue work mm-hmm. and try to balance her out before she has the baby. Yeah, absolutely. So for those who don't know maybe what that looks like, could you describe to us what dynamic body balancing is, what to expect? How does it release those torsions? <laughs> That's a big well, question, I know. Mm, <laughs> that it, you never know how it's going to look. I always sure. say, Every single person is an adventure. You are you never know, you know, what's gonna happen. So I have a basic protocol that I have people follow sure, <clears throat> based sure. on their time. Right. You don't do everything in one visit. But uh, basically we start with pregnancy. Let's let's narrow it to pregnancy. This is for everybody, male, female, okay. babies, you know, children. But if I had a pregnant woman which helps narrow this down. Yeah. I always start with them standing up because most of our injuries are done skiing, biking, walking, uh, sure. running, falling downstairs. We're usually in an upright position with gravity. Okay. Now, we may get all twisted inside with the fall, but we don't walk twisted. We have uh, right. the innate intelligence to accommodate. If this leg's going to twist to the right, well, then this one will go a little bit to the left. And then the pelvis will come to the right, and then the spine will rotate. We're always accommodating sure. with gravity to keep our body looking straight on the outside. We take, as chiropractors, take an x-ray and look on the inside. Oh, <laughs> you got such a twist in this vertebra. Right. Well, the only way that could get twisted is if the muscles are twisted. Sure. So we start with her standing, and I, I basically have them hold on to a dresser or hold on to a wall, and then have them soften their knees because that accommodating factor that we have innately can be overridden if you just soften your knees and close your eyes if you want to take away the writing reflex, and your body will recreate that injury. And it helps if someone assists them by putting pressure slight forward front to back or side to side in the pelvic floor or the rib cage and then you just say go where you feel like you need to go i'll follow you sure and they will recreate an injury now we have many injuries so their body will decide what's priority at this moment sure and i just follow so our job in doing dynamic body balancing is to facilitate that release not to make it happen right if they're perfectly balanced which is what we our goal is nothing happens they bend their knee they stand there they don't go anywhere because they're straight with gravity and then we go okay that's good and if that's good now i want to have you lay on your back and i'm going to see sometimes you're lying prone sure or supine i should say lying on your back and i will check their legs to make sure that the muscles from the feet all the way up goes all the way up your body to your head are in a state of balance so your joints are moving freely. So yeah. I just check each leg. And uh, if there's, if I stretch it or compress it, if there's torsion, it'll start to unwind. Sure. And I let it. So then the leg moves like mine did mm-hmm. in that workshop. And I follow it just to help them uh, assist that. And uh, after the legs, we may uh, have them sit up. And then I check their torso to make sure there's no torsion in the rib cage. Uh, torquing their pel- their torso, and then we'll check their arms to make sure that the wrist, the elbow, the shoulders, all the muscles attached to the arms are balanced. And then we'll check their neck, and then we check they sit up, and we check their cranials, make sure each bone, which is the bones, are just floating on the dura that mm. is wrapped around the brain. We don't really have what many people think a skull, and we have a brain inside the skull, and the brain can bounce around. No. We have a brain with uh, dura, which is a fascia. It's a membrane over the brain that goes all the way down to your sacrum. Mm -hmm. And the bones grow on that. So when we use the bones as a handle to just see, is that moving freely? Um, We see if there's any restriction in the cranium. Sure. Okay. Now, with pregnancy, whatever's going on at the top, all those membranes are attached to an area that has your pituitary, which is all your hormones. And as you're pregnant, it should get bigger and bigger because your pituitary gets bigger and bigger. And as it expands, so does your pelvis. So does your rib cage. So during pregnancy, you get wider and wider and wider to help the baby come out. And then after birth, things go back down sure. where they should be. Well, they can only expand if everything's moving freely. Sure. And all the muscles of your body are coming up and anchoring into your head to keep your head on. 
like right. a bowling ball up there. Right. And so if we have any imbalance down below, we're going to have restriction up mm-hmm. above. And if we have restriction up above, it's going to affect our hormones. Sure. And we may have too many hormones in the beginning. So the early part of pregnancy, the first three months, getting personal again, my first three months of my pregnancy, my fir- first pregnancy, I lost 30 pounds. Wow. I ate nothing. I, I was hypersensitive to sound, to taste, couldn't wow. smell, uh, couldn't eat. So I was uh, all of 98 pounds by the time I was three months pregnant. Wow. And then uh, at four months, I started contracting. And I gained back that weight, but I never got over 130 pounds by the end. But I contracted every five minutes to delivery uh, with that first one. And so there was the torsion in my body. Too many hormones in the beginning. But I had her in like three contractions. Uh, They gave me a saddle block and took her out. But it was like a train wreck when it really hit. The pain was unbelievable. Yeah. My second one, I started contracting at like four months, three to four months, every three to five minutes. And mm-hmm. that that pregnancy, again, the torsion was still there. It was worse after the first pregnancy. And I uh, was on complete bed rest and was injected with DES mm-hmm. uh, for my whole pregnancy. And uh, she was the one, they broke my water and she flew out. Sure. So there you could see that the imbalance in my body affected my daughters Mm -hmm. and their deliveries. Sure. Um, So it's generational. We always say it's it's your mother's fault. (laughs) You know, so it was my fault that they got torqued. It was my mother's fault that I got torqued. Right. We just keep going back and blaming our mothers. It's always the mother's fault. Yeah. But, yeah, we just go back and say, okay, somebody started it. Well, my mom started it with the bus accident. Sure. You know, and it just went right down the line wow um so you've got to look at the baby right away but look at the mom Mm -hmm. because that's where the torsion was that's why they couldn't get out so we don't just do the baby right got to go to the mom right get to the source Mm -hmm. make the birth easier so we don't have to do as much on the baby hopefully exactly well that was the thing i had a pediatric practice and all these injured babies i'm working 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 and and then taking histories histories and it's like we've got to do the mom if I don't take care of the mom, I'm just going to forever be taking care of babies right. that you know are suffering. So let's let's fix the mom, and ideally, let's fix her before she even gets pregnant. Right? You know, fix is not a good word. Um, let's work with her to balance her body before she even asks a baby to grow within that body. Right? You know, it's like let's let's get you ready mm-hmm. first. Do you find soft tissue or infertility can be related to soft tissue? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes in our society today, we're dealing with the effects of herbicides, pesticides affecting the hormonal sperm count. You know, so that leads a lot to the infertility. Sure. But in our field of chiropractic, it's a common joke that people come in and say, you got me pregnant. You got me pregnant. It's like, I didn't do anything. Right. But we get people pregnant because they couldn't get the sperm up into the uterus to get down the fallopian tube torsion to even impregnate wow. the yeah. mom right because of that torsion so a common question is always did you ever have cramps because if you had cramps and you shouldn't you should just release the bed you know and flow and you go Ooh, I'm, I'm having my period i didn't even know sure uh, that's what should happen but when women have cramps and especially if they start as a child you know a teenager they start having cramps we know that the pelvic floor is twisted the cervix sits in the vagina in those pelvic floor muscles right so if there's enough torsion there the blood can't get out the uterus has to contract hard enough to force the blood out so they'll know days in advance they're going to have their period because they got pms sure they are having cramping and some people can't even work they have to stay home in bed for a day right you know it's a miserable time of the month for them that tells me the torsion is in there and the blood can't get out well if the blood can't get out the sperm can't get in yeah it goes both ways right so of course they're having a difficult time getting pregnant and so uh we balance their body, adjust the pelvis, balance their body, and 
lo and behold, they get pregnant. Sure. And it's really common in my classes. We start working on people in the first class. Yeah. Next thing I know, I've got two or three people pregnant through the rest of the series. Right. Year. Right. Going through their pregnancy. Yep. I got pregnant. Yeah. You know? That's awesome. So. Okay. Yeah. And so that's why if it's soft tissue, it can work very well. Now, like I said, in today's world, we're dealing with a lot more. We're dealing with the yeah. environmental Toxins, problems because yeah. of a low sperm count. Sure. And that goes way back to the 50s, 1950s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting. Something we don't often talk about. Um, so how about tongue and lip tie stuff? I mm -hmm. feel like a lot of midwives say, just plan to get a revision. Almost every baby has a tongue and lip mm -hmm. tie. Often they're telling their clients, you just need a budget for that now. How could mm -hmm. soft tissue work also help that kind of restriction. And how many people do you know that they get a tongue tie, they get a revision, and they have to do it again? Yes. And again, right? Again and again. Um, yes. There's two issues here. One, if you don't release the soft tissue that's pulling on the frenulum, then you, you have to do it again because it's still pulling on it. Even yeah. if you cut it, it'll come back together. It'll grow back together tight. So you you we work on babies before that revision. If they still need it, they get the revision and we work on them afterwards. Sure. Okay. And it's real simple work, you know, here. But uh, why are we having so much? We didn't have that. Right. Back when I had kids, kids didn't have a tongue tie. Did they just not recognize it? You know, sure. now we not only have tongue ties, we have lip ties. We yes. have cheek ties. Never had that before. Right. And that's where, you know, that gets into the topic that is uh, extreme passion for me. Sure. And that's sonograms. And yeah, okay. uh, it, this is an anomaly that's happening. Uh, we are having short umbilical cords. They're only, you know, six mm -hmm. inches in many cases. They should be like 15 big, long things. Uh, we're having um, urethras that the hypospadia that's not going all the way to the end of the penis sure. um, or not growing at all. We're having defects in mm -hmm. the heart. There's so many heart defects that they have a whole hospital just for heart defects, you know, right. with these kids. And so this is minor compared to all the other defects that we're seeing the as other well. Midline but issues, why yeah. is that happening? And people don't realize the sonogram is mutating the DNA and mm -hmm. mutating the cells. So we're seeing these minor. We're not seeing missing arms and legs like thalidomide did. Sure. We're seeing these minor uh, defects that may seem minor because it's not a missing arm or leg, but it is major when they can't eat. They can't yes. get their tongue up. Right. Um, they can't speak. Uh, they can't swallow. This is uh, every day I get another story and another patient yeah. asking me, can you help me with this? Can you help? What do I do about this? What do right. I do about that? These are defects, mm -hmm. you know, and so... Um, the whole issue around sonograms was never studied to see if it's safe, never to see what the long-term effects were. People did not realize it. it's generational. So the first women who got them, it mutated their eggs for all the future generations. But that egg that was slightly mutated, then sure. that little girl grew up and got sonograms, which mutated her already mutated eggs more, which yeah. mutated more. And of course... We're tying it into autism. I am sure. autism and the rate I watch the autism sure. rate go up. But we have to look at defects like the tongue tie and all the physical defects that we're seeing and into cancer and sure. the rate of childhood cancer. So that's a whole podcast in itself. Yes. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> good for that. families to research. What is it? Yeah, they don't realize it. People are being told it is sound energy and the sound is in the air all the time. Mm. They don't know that the transducer that they put the gel on right. actually compresses that sound wave. It's no longer sound. It's mechanical. Sure. And that mechanical wave heats up the tissue alters the DNA, can mutate it, depending on how long they have it on, right. what is the wattage. I mean, there's so many factors that nobody has ever documented right. when they're doing a mom. How, what's our wattage? Are we keeping it below 25 megawatts? Or are we going up to 2,000? Because sure. the machine can, if I want a sure. better picture. Sure. Uh, some people are going to the mall and getting 3D. Yep. They don't realize. Because they can. Yeah. Yep. And the medical profession, the FDA won't ban it. Because then they'd have to ban it in the hospitals. Sure. You know, they, they say it should only be used for medical. And in the Institute of Ultrasound, they say it's elective. You shouldn't use it before 16 weeks. 
what are we doing? We're using it now just to see if they're pregnant. Right. And Confirmation, uh, let's yeah. check it at six weeks, right. 12 weeks, 18 mm-hmm. weeks. Right. And we all think, well, we just want to see if the baby's okay. And you're taking that risk of making yeah. a baby not okay. Sure, sure. I think also a lot of families don't realize the Doppler device that doesn't put out a picture is the same thing. They don't realize that's ultrasound. And it's worse than a sonogram mm-hmm. because the Doppler is a continuous wave. And sure. it's focused, concentrated into the heart. So that's where sure. we're getting our heart defects. We're trying to find that heartbeat. Uh, and it, it is very concentrated. Whereas sure. the sonograms are pulsed on, off, on, off, on, off. Uh, but yeah, the Doppler. And people can buy, go on Amazon and buy their own yes. Doppler and listen to their own baby, not knowing they're mutating. If that's a girl, you're mutating her eggs. Sure. And you're also affecting the mother's eggs for her mm-hmm. Other next kiddos, yeah. kids. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, as I watched this happen over the years, uh, people would bring me, I remember one family bringing me a child with cerebral palsy um, that had all kinds of damage to his body. And they said, well, it couldn't have been ultrasound because we only had two or three with him. We had many with our other children. Mm. And I had to sadly say he had all of their ultrasounds, all of them, you know. Um, with those... Because mm-hmm. his part well, of his DNA, yes. the egg before, right. was exposed. Right. Yeah. Um, do we have time for another story? Yeah, I think so. I Probably was, one left. Yeah. I was in okay. France uh, teaching, and they brought me a little girl that was paralyzed on one half of her body. She was mm-hmm. a twin. Her twin died. Mm-hmm. She lived, but she was mute and she was blind, and she had paralyzed on one side. So I sat down on the floor and I let her explore me. You know, and she had to feel me and come around me, and then I slowly started working on her. And um, I worked on her, and she wrapped her arms around my neck, and her mom, no, I'm sorry, she wrapped her arms around her mother's neck, and her mom was very stoic, made no facial expression at all, but the little girl sobbed and sobbed and sobbed as I worked on her and um, held onto her mom's neck. And I realized I was crying for the mother. It, the little girl was crying for her mother, who had never cried because mm-hmm. she lost her twin. She had to focus on this baby that was injured. So anyway, I worked on her. She went home to her grandparents, who they lived with. And the grandparents were so uh, shocked at the difference in the little girl in her ability to move arms and legs and her happiness that they asked me to come back to France. And I spent two weeks working with the uh, disabled society. They had children in their community that were, they had to have at least three disabilities to be in Mm, this. Okay. So I spent two weeks working on these kids. This was a long time ago. But I asked each parent through a translator how many sonograms that they had. Average sonogram was 17. And they all said, but it's the law. They are socialized medicine. Everybody got it. But you had to do what the doctor said or you didn't get care. And they ultrasounded them when it was a new technology, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, they couldn't see the pictures. So they turned the wattage up really high. But these kids, 17 average, and some had up to 40. And th- back then, I thought, this is outrageous. But now, jump forward almost 20 years, I um, did a study just a few years ago of my own patients, and uh, I did an online survey and uh, for sonograms. And it's not uncommon for a baby that's disabled right now to have had 40 sonograms. They did wow. it every week. Uh, you know, and they, they said, well, there's too many to count because my doctor would do it and then my my high-risk doctor would do right. it. And of course, the technician would do it and then the doctor would come in and repeat it. Mm. So sometimes they'd have four in, in a week. Wow. And um, this is, like I said, my passion. And yet, if, if, after 30 years of, of talking about this, it's like it's never going to go away. People want it, they use it, they accept it, they think it's safe, even though they never did any yeah. studies to see. They just used it. So yeah. anyway, it, I could go on and on about yeah. sonograms, but there there you go. I know firsthand yeah. uh, why I'm coming where I'm coming from yeah. with the sonograms and disabilities. Absolutely. And and this little tongue tie is so sad, but it's nothing compared to what sure. babies when you see babies in this yeah. 
you know, wheelchairs and stuff we're dealing with. But unwinding, we work with them. I teach lactation consultants to do dynamic sure. body balancing. Awesome. And then I get people coming to my classes because they want to learn to do it. Yeah. Because what they saw in that one session with a lactation consultant who looked and unwound the tongue and unwound the cheeks and balanced the body, the change in the baby, even if they needed a, a revision, uh, afterwards, because there is an anomaly, um, was so dramatic in their ability to swallow and suck and happy, and not sure. crying, that people also want to learn to do it. And anybody can learn dynamic body balancing because it's not chiropractic. It is not a sure. organized profession. It is just uh, facilitating and unwinding and letting a, letting a person unwind and letting a baby unwind. Yeah, just takes time. It just takes time, and yeah. most people don't have the right. time. They have an office to pay for and student loans to pay for, and they sure. want to just get in and get out and do the most powerful thing, you know, an adjustment. But you got to go way beyond that. So yeah. midwives, doulas, um, massage people, uh, people who want. And here in Texas, amazingly, there's a whole group of these chiropractors who are women who are learning to do this sure. and they're taking the time in their practice. They're not a two minute, get them in, get them out. Those are all the women in your class, yes. you know, and so, yes. it, Texas is unusual. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because of Parker college yes. and the person who teaches there, I trained her a long time yeah. ago. She's so wonderful. if you're introduced yeah. to it, mm -hmm. you want to learn it. Yeah. We have a great birth community here. It's mm -hmm. so nice. Unbelievable. Yeah. It is unbelievable. And I've taught all over the country, all over the world. And what I found here as far as chiropractors in Texas, amazing. Yeah. Just amazing women. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to go to a chiropractor that specifically is trained in dynamic body balancing, how would they find that? Well, they could go. It's rare. You know, sure. it's fine. But they go to my facilitator list. Okay. I have a website, dynamicbodybalancing.com. dot okay. com, and um, I have a facilitator list. Once people have taken the full hundred hours, then I put them on the list. Okay. And if it says DC, it says they're a doctor of chiropractic. Sure. Um, but then you call them and say, "Are you doing it?" Because just sure. because you've trained in it doesn't mean you're doing it. You know, and I have moms who train to take care of their own children and their their families because they live out at the far sure. reaches of Michigan sure. or North Dakota but um, they'll be on the list and you just say are you are you actually okay. practicing this because okay. if they are that's who you want to go to if you are lucky enough to find a chiropractor who does dynamic body balancing that's a gem because yeah. there there aren't that many mm -hmm. um, but here in Texas there's a lot because yeah. I've done three years of training so far here in Texas. So there's quite a few of you. It's great. I know the person I work at, Dr. Lauren Collins is there. So it's uh -huh. so nice that they can see me, go see her, get their mm -hmm. dynamic body balance. All done. in one. Yeah. You know, when you have a baby, you don't want to go here and right. go over there. Yeah. She was one of those that got pregnant in the class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She had a great birth too. Yeah. I, I had her on one of the previous episodes. So yes. Nice. I think less and than eight hours. And we worked on her so. in every class, yeah. you know, and and she had She's colleagues so who worked on her that were in the class. So yeah. yeah, awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Dr. Carol. I really appreciate you explaining just how something simple like torsion can really impact someone's labor. Oh, you're welcome. I love doing it. Let us know what you want to hear about. And if you've made it all the way to the end, please leave us a review. We would so appreciate that. Share about it. You can find like more updates and things like that on my Instagram or Facebook. It's at Bethany Stricker Midwifery on Instagram, Bethany Stricker Midwifery Care on Facebook, and then just BethanyStricker.com for website stuff. And yeah, if make sure you subscribe on Spotify or Apple so you can get notifications for further podcasts. Thanks for listening. Bye.